All right, today I want to talk to you about the Blessed Hope, one of the most important doctrines in your New Testament, um, something that if we don't have it, if we have no hope, we're very miserable. We'll see this in the study, and this is something that uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of people don't understand anymore, and a lot of people are starting to take their eyes off of Jesus Christ and turn their eyes on the troubles of this world and, and things, and they're starting to forget that hope, the blessed hope that we're supposed to have as Christians. This very important study. I want you to get a King James Bible out and I want you to read along. It's very important. We're going to start out in Titus chapter 2. We'll define the blessed hope here. Titus chapter 2. Uh, it's extremely important that you turn in the scriptures to these passages and read along and see that I'm make sure I'm telling you the truth. Titus chapter 2, we'll begin in verse 11, okay? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So sorry to the Calvinists out there that say that there are certain people that are elected for damnation. That's not true. God's grace appears to all men. It's up to them to accept or reject. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. When God's grace comes to you, you realize how much you're a sinner and how unworthy you are of salvation. All right? Uh, and it teaches you, okay, if God had grace for me, if God saved me, then I should probably try to fight against these sins that caused me to be in trouble with Him in the first place. That's just normal. Watch out again for movements, uh, again, sort of the hyper-Calvinistic movement, that teaches that God's elected you and all you have to do is just believe and it really doesn't matter if you do anything, you know, and you can live in sin and it doesn't change anything and because God's predetermined everything already and he planned out everything and, you know, actually if you sin in some ways it's really God's fault because he predetermined everything, you know. It's really quite satanic, uh, this philosophical notion of hyper-Calvinism, right? We are supposed to live separately we're supposed to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And so, well, I'll live that way when I get to heaven, when I have a perfect body and whatever else. No, you're supposed to live that way now. Okay? But look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you supposed to be looking for somebody? Yes. Uh, the Antichrist. So that then you can know that the seven-year tribulation has begun. It's not what it says. Looking for the new world order. Looking for the mark of the beast. Looking for the restored church of Rome. The holy Roman empire. No, it's you're supposed to look for Jesus Christ if you're saved. And what is it? It's a blessed hope. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, when you stop and you think about actually seeing Jesus Christ for the very first time. And you get to be with all the saints. That gives you hope. It's a blessed thing. It's a beautiful thing. We need a blessed hope in our lives. Very important there. But notice what it says. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 14. Who gave himself for us? So it mentions the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And people would say, the Trinitarian would say, well... The great God there is, is God the Father and, and our Savior Jesus Christ. Two. But then why does it go down into verse 14 and say, who says, who gave himself for us? And they'll say, well, because it's switching, you know, from a great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. The Savior Jesus Christ is the one who gave himself for us. Um, okay, let's go along with that line of reasoning. So then when we see Jesus in the future, when the catching up happens, uh, are they both going to be there? God the Father and Jesus Christ? No. We meet Jesus Christ in the air. So why is he called the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ? Because it's two different titles for the same being. There's only one God, brethren. Okay, if you don't understand the Godhead versus Trinity issue, you need to study that. You need to search the scriptures. Right? There's only one God. And it's not in three persons. Right? There are three there's body, soul, spirit. They're three separate things, but they make up one God. Man is made after the similitude of God. 
Very under, important to understand that. God has a body, soul, spirit. God can break those three different parts off. Those three things within God can break off. That's why you have the Son seated beside the Father. Certainly, the body and the soul can be separate. But it doesn't make them different persons. And you get into some of this Trinitarian stuff, you have multiple spirits, multiple bodies, multiple all kinds of things. It's a problem. There's more than one spirit, you know, according to Trinitarians. Uh, it's very important to get that because Trinitarianism puts Jesus Christ down on a lower level. He's the second person of the Trinity. And then the Holy Ghost is the third person. <laughs> okay, uh, and so he gets demoted. They say, well, no, we just are trying to talk about the order. No, they, they really believe that Jesus Christ is lower and less. But you see, if you're saved, you're looking for the blessed hope, for Jesus Christ, who is our great God. That's who I'm looking for. I'm not going to look and say, get up then and say, oh, I can't wait to see Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. You know, get up there and, oh, Jesus, oh, it's so good to see you, Jesus. So good to finally meet you, Lord, fall down on my knees and worship him. And then say, okay, where's the Father at? Where's the Holy Spirit? Where's the bird flying around? No, no, doesn't work that way. But let's continue here. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We're supposed to be zealous of good works. There's a changed life that comes. And that's the mark of a true versus a false conversion. Your life changes when God saves you. When, uh, <clears throat> when God saves you. I didn't say when you make a profession. When you start to attend church, when you faithfully uh, give 10% of your tithe, when you um, get baptized, when you speak in tongues, when you all those things are man-made, all right? <laughs> okay, when God saves you, He changes your life. Notice it doesn't say um, that you might redeem yourself from all iniquity and purify unto yourself a peculiar, you know, make yourself a peculiar person zealous of good work. No, it says that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The Lord will do things in your life when you get genuinely saved, when, he, when you're born again. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. You say, well, Brian, can't you just be about preaching the gospel? Can't you just, why do you always have to be kicking this group and kicking that group? Rebuke with all authority. Here's my authority, the Word of God. And I will rebuke according to the pages of Scripture. There's a lot of false movements out there, and they get people messed up. They'll draw people in, and then they'll lie to them. And if you're saved and you get drawn into one of these false movements, they'll sidetrack you for years and years and years, and God can't, just can't use you in those times, and you just you get messed up. But they'll get a lot of people that are, that are just made a false profession or, or whatever, and, and they'll get into these false groups, and they stay there, and they'll die, and they go to hell. They die in their sins. God never saved them. That's why I have to rebuke with all authority. A good preacher is going to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. That's what we're commanded to do. So I have to do the same thing. But let's look about this thing of the hope there. The promise of hope. Let's go the whole way back to Psalm, the book of Psalms. Psalm 31. <clears throat> if you love the Lord and His Word, you'll get a real blessing out of this study today. I, I did it. I got a very uh, major blessing from seeing this, um, you know, from putting this thing together. And the Lord just showing me how all these scriptures turn, you know, tie into to one another. It's an amazing study. Um, no glory to me at all. But uh, Psalm 31, verse 23 through 24. We're looking for that blessed hope. Remember that? Psalm 31, verse 23. O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. In other words, God rewards evil to the proud doer. God never says be proud of anything or pride is a good thing in some cases. You know, uh, proud, being proud is an abomination in God's sight. So don't fall for anybody saying, well, you know, this means that God will reward you if you're proud of something. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, he rewards evil to the, the proud doer. And he'll reward them, you know, plentifully. Look at verse 24. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope 
in the Lord. You mean the Old Testament saints were hoping in the Lord as well? Mm hmm. And what was the hope about? We'll see as we continue. Psalm 33. Psalm 33, verse 18. Psalm 33, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. They didn't even have Jesus back then. Do you ever think about that? Those Old Testament saints, they didn't even have Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't even die on the cross to pay for their sins. They couldn't even say that they were eternally secure. There's no blood there of Jesus Christ. The, the, you know, God purchased us with his blood. There wasn't anything like that. Just Levitical sacrifices and things that they could do. And, and it was just constantly that faith and work set up in the Old Testament. That's why they were sacrificing animals. Again, false prophets come out and they say, no, it was just all by grace through faith. It's always been by grace through faith. They're lying. They're lying. Uh, we don't sacrifice animals today for sins. We don't do that. We sacrifice ourselves. We say, you know, uh, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Romans chapter 12. There's no animal sacrificing. And don't tell me that they had eternal security in the Old Testament. They didn't. So God was there for them that hoped in Him. He's watching. Notice what it says there. Uh, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. God is watching you. God is watching how you're doing with this whole nonsense that's going on in the world right now. He's watching over you. Don't worry about it. Don't, uh, don't get discouraged. And I'm, I'm speaking to myself right now as well. Uh, it's been a rough year. We've seen some things that are just totally new and people are getting very paranoid and, and, you know, breathing air normally is now frightening and scary. And there's probably people that are frightened of me because I don't have a thing on my mouth. That's not normal. Okay. We're dealing with some, some major mental damage to people. Um, you see, then we should be fearful. No, we shouldn't. We should trust in the Lord. We should hope in him. We should have hope. The Lord's going to take care of us. Psalm 38. And uh, back here in the Old Testament, they didn't understand when the Lord was going to be coming. They didn't understand the timing of the resurrection. But we do. And we have a great promise. If you're saved, you have a wonderful promise in the resurrection. Psalm 38, verse 15 through 22. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin. One of the quickest ways you can tell if somebody's a false convert is if there's any sorrow for sin. Are they sorry for their sin? Say, no, not really. Well, then, then they're not saved. When you think about Jesus dying on the cross and he, and he did that because of you and what you've done, there should be some sorrow there. A little bit of contrition there. Oh boy, you know, that's bad. I'll be sorry for my sin. These lost people out there in the world, are they sorry for their sin? No, they declare their sin openly. They, they, they hide it not. They're like Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible talks about that. They don't care. All this woke stuff and whatever else, and we have to change this word now, and you can't say this, and you should be ashamed of yourself if you're white and, and your heritage. and They're wicked. What are they doing? Um, lest they you know, hear me, lest uh, otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. They hate you, in other words. Um, look at verse 19. But mine enemies are lively, and they are strong, and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. <laughs> yes, 
Absolutely. Nike just came out with a pair of uh, Satan worshiping sneakers or whatever else, and they have Luke 10, 18, I think, on the front of it. I saw a um, report on that, and, and it's, you know, it's terrible. It's a horrible thing. They're magnifying them, themselves. They're, they're multiplying. Well, then we better hope in the Lord. We better hope in the blessed hope. All right? That's coming. Verse 20. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries, because I follow the thing that good is. They want to lock you up. They want to ban this blessed book right here. That's their plans for the future. Forsake me not, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. You know, um, there's a lot of things that the, that the catching up of the body of Christ is. One of them is um, we need to be lifted out of here. I remember reading a story years ago about um, some Green Berets in Vietnam, and they were told to go in and take this high ground and draw out the enemy, and then the Air Force was going to come through and strafe the valley and take out as many enemy soldiers as they could. And before they did that, they were going to helicopter lift this Green Beret unit out of there. And uh, they were in there fighting fiercely and whatever else. And finally, the helicopters came, lifted them out, and, they, and as soon as they were out of there, Air Force came through and bombed that entire valley. Well, somewhat of a picture of the catching up of the body of Christ. God's wrath is coming, but our job right now is to draw out the enemy, to take the stands on the high ground, you see? And the helicopter lift that's going to take us out of there before the wrath is poured out is called the catching up of the body of Christ. Many call it the pre-trib rapture. And, you know, I see these people all the time in my comments section. You know, there, there is no truth to it. It's a lie. It's one of the worst lies ever. You know, and I just think to myself, boy, you are ignorant of this whole issue. I've preached for so many years on this. I've answered all the questions. Um, what is your blessed hope if you don't believe in the catching up of the body of Christ? We have a blessed hope. We're going to see the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast, and we're going to see the New World Order, and we're going to, and that's a hope to you? Well, we see Jesus at the end, yeah, after he's beat you up for seven years. That's kind of weird. You know, my blessed hope is, you know, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' wrath and, and, you know, anger, whatever. Really? You have no blessed hope if you're a post-tribber. If you go into any time of the time of Jacob's trouble, what well, we're, we're uh, pre-wrath, you know, uh, mid-trib, pre-wrath, whatever, um, then you have no hope. You're going into God's judgment, into a time where God opens the seals and pours out His wrath on this earth. Very weird. I mean, your, your enemies exalt yourself, you know, themselves against you, and I guess apparently one of those enemies must be God. Such a strange system. Psalm 39, verses 7 and 8. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in Thee. What wait I for? Hey, let me ask you a question, post tribber What are you waiting for? I've been referring to this over and over throughout the study. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for Jesus Christ, the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What are you waiting for? It's a problem. Verse 8, deliver me from all my transgressions, make me not the reproach of the foolish. Yeah, <laughs> deliver me from my transgressions. Psalm 71, see there's promises here in the Old Testament, and it's going to be very important as we tie it into the New Testament. I'm sorry if you're getting any wind noise, I'm trying to block it by turning my back to it. Um, just little bits of wind here and there. Psalm 71. It's always challenging to preach outdoors. Psalm 71, verse 12 through 15. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth show, show, shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. Hmm. 
I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. That's a challenge. That's a big challenge, brethren. Um, are you praising the Lord more and more as time goes by? Examine yourself. I have to examine myself. I have to judge myself and say, am I really praising God more and more as we're getting closer to the catching up? Uh, am I giving up on the blessed hope? Am I thinking about the Lord's return every day? You know, I, I don't teach imminence. It could be any time or whatever. The Lord knows when he's coming, but you know, we are getting close. Okay. We are in the end times. There's no question about that. It isn't some kind of a thing. Well, it's, it, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. I think it's going to happen in my lifetime. In fact, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later, uh, the Lord has it timed out perfectly. He knows when it's going to happen. It's not up to us. And oh, I did a rotten job this week. So the Lord has to put off the rapture, you know, and whatever. The Lord's tarrying or something. The Lord's not tarrying. He knows when it's going to happen. But just looking at things and the way things are working out with all this COVID, you know, past stuff and all these other things. And you start to go, okay, I think that the, the blessed hope could be getting a lot closer. I hope so. <laughs> Finally, let's go to Psalm 146 before we go back to the New Testament. Psalm 146. Also challenging to turn pages when the wind's blowing. Psalm 146, verses 5 through 8. Let's read here. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind, the Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. Do you strive to be righteous? Things that are right, do you take stands for them? Do you say, hey, that's right. I'm going to take a stand for that. That's not right. I'll, I'll be against that. If you do, then you're righteous as a saved Christian. You have to take stands. And that means you have to go against the flow of what is popular. That's what it means to be righteous. God's righteousness there. You go by the standards of Scripture and you say, well, the Bible says, you know, women are a weaker vessel. The, the modern woke culture says that women are just as good as men. Huh, the husband is the head of the wife. Hmm, is what the Bible says. Well, that's right. Equality in marriage is wrong. It's two different jobs. It's two different types of people. You, what do you mean equality? <laughs> you know, that each one has a different role, a different function. It doesn't mean that women are somehow, you know, some kind of a doormat or something. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that God has them made them different. Oh, there shouldn't be any differences between the men and women and things. Well, then you're mentally ill. I will take righteous stands according to my righteous book right here. Why? Because I want God to love me. And I have hope that he's going to take care of things. Uh, see, I have eternity to look forward to. I'm not just some stupid animal down here that believes in evolution and just says this is all there is. So I should try to fit in with the world and whatever else because I want to have a nice little happy life and peaceful and I don't want to argue with people and whatever. So I'll just keep my mouth shut because I'm a coward. No, I'm not going to do that. I have a righteous, holy standard. And this righteous standard says this is the way it is and your opinions don't matter. My opinions don't matter. It's the Bible. What saith the scriptures? They say, well, you're self-righteous. I'm not self-righteous. If I had my own standards of righteousness that didn't appear in here, then yes, that's self-righteous. But my standards come from the Bible. And I will stand be beside this book. Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, verses 6 through 8. Now we're going to see the New Testament tie into what we were reading back there in the Old Testament about the thing of hope. This is very interesting. This is where some really neat things start to show up. 
Acts chapter 26, verse 6 through 8. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Paul's on trial, in other words, here. Unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? What was the hope of Israel? What was the hope that Paul was looking forward to? He's looking forward to the resurrection. The Jews are saying, hey, someday there's going to be a resurrection. Jews today that reject Jesus Christ, they still are looking for a resurrection. They believe that there's a resurrection. It's a hope. It's a hope that we have. You could call it a Judeo-Christian hope. What's the biggest, most important hope that we have as believers? That there will be a resurrection. This life is not it. There's hope. We're not as others that have no hope. We're going to be reading that verse later. Other people out there, as an evolutionist, what do you have? Just one life? What do you accomplish? The strongest survive. Yeah, for a few years and then you die. Then you're worm food. Who cares? Oh, some people remembered me. So what? A hundred years from now, they won't. Your, your family and friends will be dead. Your life means nothing if you're an evolutionist, if you're an atheist. What hope do you have? We have hope that science will improve and improve and improve and maybe someday people won't have to die or something. Or Well, although that doesn't work because then you'd have overpopulation. I guess your hope is Star Trek, perhaps. You know, that you get to eventually be so brilliant that you can fly around in spaceships and, and destroy other planets. <laughs> you know, man made a wreck of Earth, so let's, let's, you know, let's have science eventually make it so that we can go, you know, mess up other planets or something. Wow, what hope. What a, what a glorious future. <laughs> Stupid. Stupid. Uh, what do Muslims have? You know, what does Islam have as far as a hope? You know, if you die in, in battle or something, you get to go to what the... What is it? Uh, trying to think of the word. Okay, all I'm thinking is Mecca, but that's not it. That's where they go on the earth. Um, but they go to their version of, of heaven or whatever else. And there's a bunch of women that you can fornicate with up in there and whatever else. You know, uh, kind of a weird thing, kind of a twisted version of Valhalla, you know, or something. And you know, all these different cultures. What, what hope do they have? But Jews and Christians have a hope. We believe that there's a resurrection. We believe that when you die and you're buried, that someday you're going to be resurrected. That's the hope. And Paul's saying, you know, the, the Jews, my nation, Israel, we have a hope there for the resurrection. And that's what I'm preaching. And my own people are getting mad at me for preaching the hope that we've been looking for. I'm here to declare Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection and the life. He brought Lazarus up from the dead. Don't you people remember that? It was reported around and people talked about it. Don't you remember that? There's hope. Can I preach the hope? And they're saying, shut him up, put him in prison. <laughs> hate crime, hate crime. <laughs> Turn next to Romans. You know, I, I'm as a, as a quote-unquote pre-trib preacher, and understand that's not the Bible term, I'm just using that because that's what people know in popular culture, but the catching up before the, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, that's hope. There's a hope there. I'm trying to preach hope to you people. You're a liar. How dare you lie to us? We're going into the tribulation. There is no escape. <laughs> Thank you for lightening my day. Boy, I really appreciate it. Boy, I feel so much better now that I know that Jesus is not coming back and I'm going to have to face the wrath of God for seven years or three and a half years. <laughs> oh, thank you. Boy, where would I have been without you? Romans chapter 5. Bunch of nuts. Verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. You know the rough times that you go through in this life? We have hope. Why? Because there's a resurrection coming. Because we get to go to heaven someday. There's hope. 
Verse 6, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Were you ungodly before you got saved? Well, I was just in unbelief and I had to come to belief. No, you were ungodly. You were wicked. And if you don't see yourself that way and just simply say, I just had unbelief and whatever else, uh, that's a problem, you self-righteous, wicked person, you. We were ungodly. We were wicked. We were sinners worthy of death before Jesus Christ saved us. Verse 7, For scarce, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. Much more than being now justified by, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We're saved from what? Wrath. Well, see, oh, the wrath doesn't start till three and a half years into the time of Jacob's trouble. That's when it starts. Okay? Um, so the Lord unleashing the Antichrist on the earth, that's not wrath. How about uh, taking peace from the earth? Famine. You know, war and death and hell and all the other. That's not God's wrath. That's not his wrath, you know. And you get these ignorant posties who actually have to get to a point where they say that Jesus is not causing these things on the earth. He's just kind of pulling back the seals so he can be a spectator. That the devil's the one doing the, the first seven or for, first, uh, yeah, the first seven seals. You know, that's the devil doing that stuff. Then why does it say that no man in heaven was worthy to open the seals until the Lamb of God shows up? If it's the devil doing this thing, wouldn't he be the one opening the seals? You know, it's craziness, absolute craziness. But that's what you have to get to when you're a liar. These whole post-trib, this whole post-trib system is so wicked. As time has gone by, my, my attitudes towards them have gotten a lot more radical because I see just how wicked these people are, just how much they are willing to change the scriptures. That's why I get very radical and angry towards them. They're trying to destroy the blessed hope. You get it? You understand? You have no hope if you're a post-tribber. You have no hope if you are a pre-wrath, uh, mid-trib, whatever. You have no hope. You're not looking for the blessed hope of the great God, of the appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You're not looking for that. You're looking for a whole host of other things. The next face that you see is, is the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. It's a problem. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 14. Down through verse 28. Okay, I have my notes down here on the ground. That's why I'm looking like this. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Are you fearing the Antichrist showing up? That's not the spirit that is revealing that to you. Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. When does that happen? Well, ultimately at the resurrection. And then, at, you know, after that, you have the judgment seat of Christ. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. In the resurrection, we are the sons of God. We become the sons of God. Sons of God in the New Testament are references to angels. Okay, and in the Old Testament as well. Hmm. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. We're waiting for the... Uh, manifestation of the sons of God. We're waiting to have our body changed. Verse 20, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Huh. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, 
even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. You know, another thing I've experienced with post-tribbers down through the years, a lot of them, there's no struggle between their flesh and their spirit. They'll go out there, they'll go and, and party with the world and, and, and live it up with the world and whatever. They don't really suffer much. They don't talk about being so vexed by the rock music in the store. They don't really talk about being vexed by the way people are dressed out there in the lost world. They don't talk about their personal struggles with sin. They're just preparing themselves. Boy, they're going to get into that time of Jacob's trouble and they're going to survive and I'm going to endure to the end. You're going to watch me. These pre-tribbers, they're not ready like I'm ready. I'm getting ready for the tribulation. I'm looking forward to it. I have actually had a post-tribber say to me the one time, I am looking forward to going into the tribulation so I can fight the Antichrist. Was he vexed by the world? No. Is he saying, boy, I just can't stand this body of mine. Oh God, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Like Paul said in Romans 7. No, there's no struggle. They're not tired of themselves. They're not tired of their flesh. They could care less. I can't wait for the redemption of my body. That's my blessed hope, you see. Look at verse 24. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. You're not seeing Jesus Christ. There has to be believing by faith. And we hope that he's going to redeem our body. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Looking for that uh, blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Hmm. Do, then do we with patience wait for it. You know, it takes a lot of patience to wait for Jesus Christ sometimes. <laughs> uh, amen. <laughs> it's a little rough sometimes down here. Sometimes you think to yourself, it's got to be this year. It just has to be soon. I don't understand what he's waiting for and, and whatever. You know, and you think, there are some verses over in the Song of Solomon that kind of make it look like, you know, the bride is there and she's, you know, arise my love, my fair one and come away. It's spring, you know, and you think, it's getting to be spring, you know, and then you, a lot of people fall for the September 23rd thing. I fell for that a few years, and, you know, you kind of think, I think it's going to happen, and it doesn't happen. <sighs> Another year. Oh, great. <laughs> That's the, the attitude of a Christian. Um, we're supposed to be patient. That's the hard part, but uh, we're waiting for Jesus Christ. We're looking for Jesus Christ. Um. I've had a number of dreams over the years, and I don't put much stock in dreams, but I've had these dreams where I'm outside doing something, and all of a sudden it's something feels weird, and I look up in the sky, and I see a door open, and, whew, and I hear, come up hither, and boom, I go. Then I wake up, and I think, oh, it's just a dream. <laughs> I never wake up and go, oh, you know, boy, I'm glad that that didn't happen. It's always a disappointment. You know why? Because I'm looking for Jesus Christ. He's my blessed hope. Do I have hope in this world? Do I have hope that things will work out? And, and uh, you know, I, I have great hope that uh, America is going to be great again, that we're going to restore the republic and we're going to have gold and silver as our currency and we'll have, you know, peace and safety and what? No, I don't have hope in that. No, no, I don't, I don't hope in that. I have hope that Jesus Christ is going to say, okay, now it's time to come home. Whatever his timing is, however he works the thing out, uh, that's fine by me. If he wants to take us out and work it so that it's a few years till the time of Jacob trouble starts or something, and I just don't see it from the scriptures, well, that's up to him. But come and get us soon, Lord. I sure am hoping for the redemption of this body. Groaning a lot of times. Can we go now, Lord? How much more of this do we have to put up with, Lord? Verse 26, here's some encouragement for you, brethren. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. He might purify unto himself a peculiar people. God's purifying you. The Spirit helpeth our infirmities. 
the Holy Spirit will help you. It's not just up to you and you just, God isn't going to do anything to help you fight sin. The Holy Spirit will help you. He's helping your infirmities. How about that? It's a wonderful thing. And here's another part about it. The Holy Spirit knows what you're going through. He knows the trouble. He knows the anguish of soul. And, the, and, the, and when you're saying, oh God, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I fell for that again. Lord, I just wish you'd come and, and whatever. The Holy Spirit knows. He understands. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Do you ever get so sad? You go to pray and you don't even know what to say. Just kind of, oh Lord, I, I, you know, somebody betrayed you or some other bad thing like that, and you're just groaning inside, just, oh, I can't believe this. Family members, and they go and they get the, you know, the vaccine and whatever else, and you just go, oh, Lord, I, I don't even know what to say. The Holy Spirit understands. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Lord Jesus Christ makes intercession for you. He is the Spirit of truth. He is the Holy Spirit. It's one being. It's God. Okay? So it's not Harry seated to say that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. They are one and the same being. Look at 28, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. It's all going to work together for good. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Good times are coming for us. And we have a blessed hope that we can look at that. You know, it's not just, oh, we get to go to heaven when we die and it's going to be wonderful. We come back down to this earth after being with the Lord for seven years up in heaven. The Lord says, okay, I'm about ready to pour out my judgment on this earth. Come up hither. We go up. The Lord says, okay, let's watch the show. We look down. We watch everything. Mystery Babylon gets destroyed. We have a big party. I'm definitely looking forward to that. And then the Lord says, let's go back down again. And you're going to rule and reign with me for a thousand years. And then after that, we have the great white throne judgment. And then we go into eternity. What's it going to be like? What's it going to be like to be walking on streets that are paved with gold? In fellowship with Jesus Christ, there's no night there. There's no need of the sun. Why? Jesus Christ lights it. It's light all the time. Wow. Can you imagine? Can you fathom that? It's a blessed hope. When we see Jesus, Jesus says, come on in. I bet you he can't wait to show us what he's prepared for us. Do you ever think about that? I bet you it's hard for him too. He has his plans. He has things written out and whatever else and planned and everything. But you know what? The Bible says that precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Paraphrasing a little bit there, but... The Lord isn't some, you know, up there just going, oh, yeah, oh, that's right, I saved you. Yeah, uh, just go stand over there. I'll figure out something. He's looking forward to seeing you if you're saved. He's got some neat stuff prepared for us. It's a blessed hope. So, Brother Brian, I, I'm, my job's not very good, and I don't have a nice place to live, and I, I'm starting to develop some health issues, and oh, things are just not going so good. Uh, groanings, hmm. suffering, tribulation. See, our tribulation is right now, <laughs> if you're saved. We're not looking for the great tribulation. We're already in it, <laughs> okay? Uh, and I don't mean the book of Revelation. I'm saying, if you're born again, your tribulations are now. You know what I'm talking about, too. You have family members that you love dearly, and they hate you. They cast out your name as evil. Um, there are people that call themselves Christians that hate you and cast out your name as evil. Um, people think that you're weird. You don't have very many friends. You're lonely. You have health issues. You have horrible nightmares at night. 
So what do you have to hold on to? Oh, just a book that tells me about a blessed hope. Romans chapter 15. A glorious future. We have it, brethren. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We're to abound in hope, brethren. You know, the darker it gets for this world, the brighter it should get for us. The more we should see we're getting close, looking for that blessed hope. We're looking the resurrection, the resurrection, the dead saints that have gone on before us that are waiting in heaven and we which are alive and remain. Wouldn't it be neat to go without dying? How about that one for a hope, a promise of hope that we have? Get to go up to, to heaven and you never have to die. You never have to know what it's like to be laying there in a car after the accident happened and slowly feeling your life drifting away and the pain and everything or or you know, worse yet, you get uh, total Catholic takeover or whatever else, and they're you down in some dungeon someplace, and they're torturing you to death, like happened to many, you know, millions of Christians down through the centuries. How about just uh, today, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ? Look up. All of a sudden, that door opens. And you hear your voice, or you hear your name. The Lord, you hear his voice for the first time. Come up hither. Immediately. I was in the spirit. It's going to happen. You say, what if I die first, brother? What if something happens to me? What if things go really bad in this country, and there's war, and there's fighting, and there's death, and whatever else? And, you know, I know some of you, you know, you're in the city, you're stuck in situations you can't get out of and things. I get it. I understand. I, I'm a big proponent of the off-grid thing. I'm here on my land, you know, the Lord gave us and things, and we're, I'm thankful for that. And it's not an easy life living here either, so don't think that. <laughs> um, it's difficult. Uh, we, ha we all have our struggles. We all have our issues. But you know what? Um, there's one thing that we all have in common, no matter where you live, and that is if you're saved, you have a blessed hope. No matter what happens, if you get killed for Jesus Christ, if you die, you get to go up first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We have blessed hope. Someday, those sore aching limbs of yours, those, that sore aching body of yours, um, is going to be walking around with no pain. Someday, you won't be walking on an old, beat up old floor with cracked linoleum and and walls that need to be painted and you don't have the money to paint them and, and an old walk outside to an old car that doesn't run all that good and whatever. Someday you're going to be walking on streets of gold. Someday you'll be walking down here on this earth knowing there's no corrupt politician anymore that tells us that we have to lock things down and we have to this and that. Jesus Christ ruling and reigning from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. No worries about oh, will he be able to be voted in next election or something. It's gone. It's over. Done. That's hope. That's the hope that we have as Christians. And if you've been watching this and you don't know that, if, you, if you're not saved, then you have no hope. Truly for you, it is not looking good in the future. Let me read a verse to you if you're lost. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter four. I'm having a little difficulty turning here. My hands are about my left. My right hand is numb. I can't have gloves on both of my hands because then I can't turn the pages of my Bible. It's about 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside right now, so it's pretty cold. And of course, the wind blowing doesn't help either. It keeps turning my pages the wrong direction. Where would we be without this book? <laughs> Amazing. People cut on this book and make fun of this book. I don't get it. Oh, you're a Christian, and yet you can make fun of the King James Bible. 
No, I don't think so. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. I remember I uh, went to a fast food restaurant many years ago, back before I met my wife, and there was some woman, kind of an overweight woman, and she had a sort of her sleeves rolled up, and she had this big tattoo up here about, she had a picture of a baby's face tattooed to her arm, and then she had the name of the baby, don't remember what it was, and the birth and the death date, and died after a few months or whatever, you know, and she lost a child, and she uh, tattooed that baby's face onto her shoulder there so she could remember. And uh, in her mind, she had no hope. Just, I have to remember this, this, you know, my little precious baby that died and whatever else. Well, um, as Christians, we don't have to think that way. We don't have to go to the graveyard and just say, oh, it was grandpa and grandma. I can't believe that they died. It's just not the same. And, you know, I remember going to their house at the holidays or going over there in the, during the summer and the, you know, picnics that we'd have together and I'll never see grandma and grandpa again. Well, if they're lost, you know, that's partly true, but um, if they're saved, you'll see them. Oh, the Apostle Paul, boy, I sure look up to him, but I wish I could meet a guy like that, but it'll just never happen. Uh, we're not as others that, that have no hope. There is a resurrection of the dead, and we're going to get to see all those who have died and gone on before us. It's a wonderful thing. But uh, let me kick the post-trib thing again. Uh, what hope do you have? You see, if you're a post-tribber and you really understand the scriptures and you really take the scriptures as they are, um, you can go into the time of Jacob's trouble and if you take the mark of the beast and worship the beast in his image, you have to to get a job, you know, you have to to, to do this. And it's funny because most post-trib preachers totally went along with the pandemic thing. All the stuff shut their churches down, wearing the face masks, doing all the stuff. But they're somehow going to fight against the Antichrist when he shows up and says, Mark the Beast. Yeah, right. Uh, they won't. Okay. But uh, if you're a post-tribber and you go into that time and you take the Mark, worship the Beast in his image, you lose everything. There's no, well, I have eternal security. I'm sealed until the day of redemption. No, you're not. <laughs> That's not true for you if you go into that time period. You can't take the Mark and worship the Beast in his image and expect to go to heaven when you die in spite of what Ken Hoven and John MacArthur both have said. Well, I'm not really sure. I don't think that, you know, I think that you probably can take the mark if you're saved because God wouldn't expect you not to work. That would cause contradictions with Scripture. And Well, yes, it would cause contradictions of, with Scripture, but that's why you rightly divide and you realize a Christian's not going to go into that time period. And there are things in the Pauline epistles that don't apply to the people that are in the time of Jacob's trouble. Just like there's things in the Old Testament that don't apply to us today. And there's things in the future that don't apply to us today. Unless you rightly divide the word of truth, if you just say the whole Bible's mine, every chapter, every verse, every line, Genesis to Revelation, well, then you're rather ignorant, right? Uh, that's not true. That's not true at all, right? You can go through and you can see some things and learn things and whatever, as we did today. We went back to the Old Testament. But doctrinally, you have to rightly divide and say there are certain things that are not written to me. Right? You have to be very careful about that. You say, well, I disagree. Okay, then go sacrifice your animals. All right? Go to the Levitical priest and, and you know, have a sin offering and a trespass offering and all the other stuff. Go to the official temple in Jerusalem. You see what I'm saying? But we're not other, like others that have no hope. And if you're a post-river, you have no hope. You're not looking for the blessed hope. You're looking for a time that you're going to have to survive and you might not make it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. This is where we'll end our study. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. We're to watch, looking for that blessed hope. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and look at this, and for an helmet, the hope of of salvation. Huh. We'll come back to that. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, 
we should live together with him. Um, I have great hope. Okay? And uh, that great hope comes from the helmet of salvation there, the, 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 the hope of salvation. Say it that way. The helmet there. You wear a helmet when you're in battle. Um, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Say it that way. The hope of salvation, the, that blessed hope. That's the final completion of our salvation. That is redemption of the purchased possession. Again, I've preached about that. Um, you're not fully 100% redeemed here on this earth. Why? Your body's still corruptible. This corruption here must put on incorruption. I don't have eternal life in my body right now. Now I have the promise of eternal life, but that, re that redemption of the purchased possession is yet in the future. That is the blessed hope. That's the resurrection. That's what the Jews were looking forward to in the Old Testament. That's that hope that they had. We have that hope today. So, if you're saved. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, I just wanted to, to, to really preach this. I haven't preached on the, the rapture issue in a little while. I'd say little things here and there, but it's just it's such an important doctrine to understand um, it is a it is a major doctrine, and again, a lot of the false preachers out there will say it doesn't really matter. Um, it's a I'm I'm a pan tribulationist. I've heard that it'll all pan out in the end. That's not true. Um, it's not all going to pan out. If if it's if it's post trib, you go the whole way through the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, as it's properly called. You go the whole way through it. You can lose your salvation, and you have to endure to the end, and you are facing God's wrath and judgment the whole way through it all kinds of scriptural inconsistencies there. You say, well, but I'm mid-trib pre-wrath is, is a, you know, one of these new positions that Marvin Rosenthal basically came up with, <coughs> excuse me, in the, what, 1980s? Kind of funny. Then they'll talk about John Nelson Darby creating the rapture, which he didn't, in 1830. Well, how about Marvin Rosenthal creating the mid-trib pre-wrath position? <laughs> and uh, the other guy, the Baptist preacher, um, the one that messed up Hoven, uh, Rasmussen, Roland Rasmussen is another one that came up with this mid-trib, uh, stupid nonsense, pre-wrath mid-trib. You're going into a time where you don't have that hope. You're going into a time when you can lose your salvation. I mean, the single greatest argument against this whole going into any part of it is, you go into any part of it, you have God's judgment coming on you, number one, that's a problem. God doesn't judge you know, the righteous like that, uh, doesn't judge them along with the, the wicked. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You know, Abraham says to the Lord back there when he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and he says, you know, you need to get Lot out of there before you judge it. You know, you'd spare, God would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah if he could have found 10 righteous men, and he, did, he didn't. So God comes in and he takes Lot out. He doesn't say, well, you know, this will help purify Lot. Here we go. <sighs> sun the fire it doesn't work that way all right um so what i'm saying is when you get saved one of the things that you have to do is you have to put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand you know against the wiles of the devil and one of those wiles is he tries to get through to your brain and your mind and the helmet of salvation is the hope the blessed hope you keep that you remember that and that keeps your head safe. And the devil comes and says, you're going to go into the tribulation. He's a ping, goes off the helmet. No, I'm not. I have hope. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. Um, you're going to have the mark of the beast. It's going to be implemented later this year. What? Ping. No, sorry. I still have my helmet on. But uh, when you start to say, uh, maybe I should uh, open my mind a little bit. I'm in battle and the bullets are flying thick around me. They're flying past me. I can hear them whizzing through the air. Let me take my helmet off. You're a fool. You're quite foolish. And yet that's what a lot of people do. Um, brethren, keep your helmet on, okay? You need to keep the helmet of salvation on your head and say, Jesus Christ isn't going to put me into a time period where he's going to pour out wrath on me. It makes no sense. Or he's going to pour out judgment. He'll unleash the Antichrist on me. Why? What would it do? What would it prove? 
that'll prove who's truly saved and who's who's not or whatever who's truly sanctified and then what the the whole post-trib system is a satanic lie um you know for those who are say they're trying to get to your take you you know get get your head get a headshot on you um for post-tribbers, yes, it is true. They will be going through the time of Jacob's trouble because they're self-righteous and they they feel like they have to endure to the end. And in their case, they will. But just, I can't stress this thing enough, brethren. The devil wants you to take your helmet off, that part of your armor. Um, you can take a shot to the arm in battle. You can take, uh, I remember Oliver Cromwell when he was in battle, he actually took a sword hit to the neck got hit in the neck with a sword while he was fighting. Um, you can take that. You take a blow to the head, your chances of survival are not so good. I mean, you don't want to get hit there. And so the devil wants you to take your helmet off. He wants you to get rid of the blessed hope so that you uh, start to fear. You fear man. That's going to be it for this study. And I uh, just... Really, I'm going to keep preaching as long as I can on this rapture issue. <clears throat> um, I'll never, ever back off on it. I will never say, well, I think perhaps that, you know, we will go into the time of Jacob's trouble. No, it's not going to happen. It would violate so many scriptures and contradict so many scriptures. Uh, it is not a new teaching. Again, you know, it's just to say this because I know there are new people that come along all the time. They'll say the pre trib rapture is a new teaching. Uh, and very easy answer to that. You say, oh, really? Um, well, uh, who was teaching that the church goes through the tribulation before then? Could you show me the proof? Um, it's the Catholic Church. So uh, <clears throat> the Catholics kill Christians and, and burn their works, and then they say, there's no ancient writings. There's no ancient uh, anything teaching these. These are just modern inventions since the Reformation or whatever else. Prove us wrong. Well, you killed the people and burned their writings. How can we go back to what they had when you burned everything? So, uh, just really be careful. Because the devil wants you to take the hope of salvation off. The helmet of salvation, the hope that you have that you're going to see Jesus Christ. The thing that keeps your mind safe. Don't take your helmet off, brethren. We'll see you in upcoming videos. Thank you for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.